Coalition here on CAN TV, uh, Comcast Station 21 in Chicago. Uh, for our regular viewers, welcome back. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome also. My name is Minister Michael Muhammad. I am the co-founder of the Street Peace Coalition. We are a grassroots um, violence prevention and intervention organization um, that attempts to have an impact neighborhood by neighborhood on acts of violence by um, dealing directly with those uh, who have some ability to affect what goes on in the neighborhood. All of our members are pretty much um, formally incarcerated and formally uh, affiliated with some street organization, except for myself. And so <clears throat> we uh, deal directly with those who understand the nature of how the streets function, how they breathe, how they operate. And we deal with black people specifically about how black people um, can control what goes on in their own neighborhood. And so we have um, a pretty um, set way that we do that, that we find effective, that builds uh, a sense of community and a sense of neighborhood when done correctly. And so we come to you each week on this show. This is our third season uh, with you on Can TV 21. This is a live call-in show. You can call in. You see the number on your screen, 312-738-1060 with your question or your comment, and we'll get you right on the air. But we come to you every week. Um, last season, we highlighted some of our key members of the Street Peace Coalition. Uh, so those of you who may have caught us last season, you got a chance to see some of the uh, men and women engaged in this work that we do in the community. Um, this season, I have primarily been your host here uh, uh, on our show, talking to you uh, about our views, our assessments, our opinions, our critiques, uh, our outlook when it comes to violence, specifically in the black community. And so we are firm believers that we must take responsibility for our own fate, for our own destiny, for our own neighborhoods, and in spite of the tremendous schemes, the tremendous uh, external plannings, the, the, the extreme biases, prejudices, and uh, racial animus that is directed toward our community, we still believe and know that as a people, we can rise above all of that and break through all of that when we learn to come together when we learn our own potential, our own power, our own ability to determine outcomes in our families, in our, on our block, in our neighborhoods, and in our community. We can, have, um, we can have what we want if we take the right mindset and the right approach. And if we want violence to come down, then we've got to be honest in our conversations about violence. We cannot have unrealistic discussions about violence. We have to be very critical, not only of those outside of our community that may have some impact on the violence in the community, but most importantly, we must be critical of ourselves because we cannot afford to um, empower the, um, uh, the victim mentality. We cannot afford 
to continue to vest our fate uh, in solutions that come out of the mind, the victim mindset. And the victim mindset only means that we think that there's somebody outside of us who has the power to do for us things that we cannot do for ourselves. And when we continue to believe that somebody else has more power, more intelligence, more vision, more intellect, more strength, uh, more commitment to impact our lives than we have of those things to impact our lives, then that, that is a victim mindset. And the victim mindset uh, is called that because it continues to perpetuate uh, the, the production of victims. And so we cannot say we want peace. We cannot say we are tired of people being victimized in our community and hold on to a victim mentality. It is really a irrational thought process. It is an oxymoron, if you will. Uh, we have to come up out of that victim mentality and we have to talk straight words with one another as family. We have to look at ourselves in the mirror. And I, and I mean we have to be honest about the naked truth of ourselves. And so as a, one of my good brothers, uh, Harold Davis, local activist, has a radio show called The Butt Naked Truth. And every day... He lays out the case for the butt naked truth. Well, if we're going to talk about violence, if we're going to really deal with ending violence, we've got our, our repertoire, our toolkit has to go beyond a march. It has to go beyond a teddy bear balloon uh, memorial on the side of the curb or the street where the victim laid down their life. It has to go beyond... Um, uh, prayer vigils. It, 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 all of these things are acceptable things in response to our hurt and our pain. But when we talk about solving the problem, we have to have some very sobering conversations because the violence in our community is not happening in a, vi in a vacuum. We are not experiencing this violence by accident. It is not a organic thing. It is in fact an engineered thing. It is in fact the byproduct of some social, economic, and yes, spiritual engineering that is designed to produce a certain type of behavior and lifestyle in our community and we've got to address that as painful as it may be for some of us because mm -hmm. most of us we are good at blaming other people but not good at accepting the truth of ourselves I have a caller caller go ahead yes uh, good evening my friend good evening you know you, you sit up there every week and talk what's supposed to be but it's never going to be unless. And let me tell you why. You talk about victims. We are our own victims. You can't go outside without getting shot. You know, you can't go in the yard. You can't do anything. You can even go to your home without the fear of being shot. So we are the victims of our own people. Black, white, and it don't matter. It don't matter. As soon as we can get together, could you imagine a coalition between the African American and the Hispanic? This city would be great once again. Because we know what's wrong with it. We know what's wrong with this. The people downtown don't know what's wrong with it because they don't do nothing about it. If you ever get a coalition, and that's why I say, you did run for mayor, and I surely would back you because you know what 
this to me to be great again. Thank you. Thank you, caller. And for those of you who couldn't hear him clearly, basically the caller was saying that we need to develop a coalition between the black and the brown community uh, and empower ourselves and that we are in fact victims of our own, um, uh, we're victims of one another, which is true. Um, and so I'm not dismissing the truth of that statement because the fact is the um, murder rate for blacks by blacks is the highest of any other group in America. And it has been that way since roughly about 1964-65. And you will find that our homicide rates, our murder rates, began to escalate from that point on all the way into the 80s. It was at its highest. It had some dip in the in uh, slight dips, and then it was very high in the 90s, and it's been coming down since the 90s. Uh, in fact, the murder rate now is much lower than it was in the 80s and the 90s. But the nature, the type, the quality of the violence is 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 a lot different than it was in the 80s and the 90s, and so that is tied to street culture. Because uh, up until about um, 95, 96, 97, there was a strong street culture in terms of our street organization still having a sense of structure and code. And so there was a time, even though we've had a long-standing existence of street organizations, that practice violence, there was a street code. There was a clear demarcation between active participants and what we might call civilians. That broke down after 96, 97. That, that began to disintegrate. Uh, and so uh, here we are today in 2017, we have a lower murder rate a lower homicide rate than that period of time, but the nature of the violence is, it has a unique quality um, that is tied to uh, something that we also have to track going back to really uh, the early 60s, late 50s, and that is when you find a dramatic, a 200 times increase in uh, the likelihood that our families would be headed by single parents. And so the, there was a, a uh, attack, if you will, on the ideal of two parent families in the black community starting in the late 50s into the 60s. And so you see that trend uh, uh, coinciding with the uptick trend of black on black violence in that same time period. And so when we talk about murder and homicide, we're talking about a demographic of young men primarily uh, between the ages of, of roughly 17 to approximately 34 or 35 years old with the biggest a uh, chunk of that demographic being the uh, 17 to roughly 25 year olds uh, males who uh, are most uh, guilty of being perpetrators of violence as well as uh, most likely to be victims of that violence. And so when we look at violence, as I was saying, we have to have an intelligent, intelligent somewhat non-emotional um, conversation if we're going to deal with it effectively because it is not happening, it is not a random event, it is not an organic or natural event, it is, it is there are factors driving the violence 
in the black and brown communities, especially in the black community, that will never, ever, look, uh, I am a minister, and I believe in spirituality at every level, but I'm here to say to you that as a man of prayer, of fasting, etc., prayer alone will never deal with the conditions that produce this violence in the black community. We have to be sober about dealing with this issue. So if the perpetrators of violence tend to be black men, and if the trend of violence was really piggybacked by street organizations or on the backs of street organizations with the assassination of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King and the pent-up rage and frustration, the degradation, the poverty, the want of proper education, all of that was pent up in black America, in black men in particular, and it exploded in the mid-60s. And this is when you see the rise of black-on-black -black fratricidal uh, behavior. And so if, as black men, we are intimately involved in this culture of violence, then somebody has to have the courage Somebody has to be willing to stick their neck out and put their neck on the line. Somebody has to be willing to take the heat, the controversy, the mixed feelings around speaking the truth to other black men. It cannot be a white man who says it. It cannot be an Asian or an Irishman or an Italian. It has to come from one of our own. And I am one of our own, and this is why we use this platform not to necessarily jump on the mayor or the police, but I'm trying to speak to black men. We are the ones who have the power. If we would find the unity, the courage, and dare to humble ourselves to learn how to be effective in transforming the minds of our young men in particular, and now even our young women, we would begin to reverse this deadly trend of violence in the black community. Caller, go ahead. Caller, are you there? Yes. I, I sure am. Go ahead. Yes, my friend. I, I call it good because, you know, what gets me uh, is that Three o'clock in the morning, there's to be a police shooting, and there's three unjust witnesses. Let there be a guy drive by, or, or, or just people going up to a porch and shooting, and nobody saw nothing. Now, until that stops, we're going to be in the same place. You know that. So uh, I'm, I'm happy that you said, come on. You know, grow a pair and let's get this together and then this way maybe, just maybe, we can stop all this crazy ass violence. Thank you, caller. Thank you. The caller said that he <clears throat> is frustrated with the fact that when the police shoot one of us, we have hundreds of protesters, if not thousands. But when we shoot each other, there seems to be no protesters. Well, this is the paradigm of being the victims of uh, modern colonization. I'll put it like that. When you have been taught to loathe yourself, self-loathing, when you taught to hate yourself, self-hatred, when you have been taught that you are worthless, when you only see yourself as a, as, as a nigger, when you only see yourself as some uh, degraded form of existence, then you place no value in the destruction of that life. And so the reason we don't, uh, you know, it's, I, I use this analogy. 
If you see me standing outside of the grocery store punching another person, it elicits in you a certain reaction. You may call the police. You may try to intervene or what have you. But if you, the next day, you see me standing in front of that same store punching myself, your reaction is different to me inflicting violence on myself. You may acknowledge that I am mentally imbalanced. You may acknowledge I have a problem, but your reaction is generally going to be much less visceral than when you see me inflicting violence on somebody else. And so it is innate within the human psyche to understand that we are inflicting violence on ourselves. And so our reaction is less visceral, but no less traumatic, mind you. It's no less traumatic, but our responses is, are different from somebody external to us committing an act of violence because that is the nature of the human psyche. When we talk about homicide in the black community, the brown community, we're talking about a unique form of violence that is self-inflicted. And so you deal with people who, who have a, a mental imbalance that causes them to do harm to themselves much differently than you deal with people who have a mental imbalance that causes them to do harm to others. And the fact is, th when I harm another black person or another brown person, I uh, am inflicting harm on myself. And so there's a different social response. This is just the nature of the human psyche. But since we've never been properly informed and educated upon, about the nature of social engineering that is behind our acts of violence, then we get frustrated with what we see on the surface because nobody is taking us deeper into this phenomenon of black-on-black -black violence. And this is why we come to you every week to try to stimulate your minds to think deeper about this problem. And once you begin to think deeper deeper about the problem, you will realize that it is up to us to get off of our seat, off of our couch, off of the sidelines. It doesn't matter if it's one young man, two young men, five young men. It doesn't matter if it's just the house next door or the two houses next door. It doesn't matter where you start, but I'm saying to us as adult men, we must step up and stand in the gap with this violence because you will find our young men are lost without guidance. They're lost without good examples. They're lost without proper information, education, and knowledge of themselves. And it is our responsibility as the big brothers, the uncles, and the fathers in the community to, to give this service to our young men. If we expect them to do something better and different, then we have to do something better and different as the guardians of the children that we produce from our loins. We cannot blame, sit back and blame uh, City Hall. We cannot just sit back and blame the government alone. What about what we can do? Those of you who were formerly or currently involved in street organizations, what is your responsibility to the future of the community? Why do we continue to ingrain in the minds of our young boys this uh, fratricidal mentality or a lifestyle that leads to murder, death, and mayhem in the community. Is there not a better way even when we claim affiliation with the street organization? Well, I'm out of time uh, for this week, but I hope you will contemplate my questions to you, those of you who are viewing and listening. Until next week, this is Minister Michael Muhammad signing off for the Street Peace Coalition on Chicago Can TV Channel 21. Thank you for viewing.